can we do? CISA is the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency as a US entity. Um, I was somehow unaware of them before I started on this process. Um, they are focused on cybersecurity infrastructure. Um, they've got a very broad mandate. And I was looking around for federal government uh, agencies that understood that there's a counter UAS threat and we're doing something about it. Enter CISA. Um, everything you see here is comes from their website. They've got a lot of really good materials in, uh, in terms of how to talk about it. They've got one pagers, they've got placards, they've got all sorts of materials for educating different types of people about the nature of the threat and what actions can you take about it. Um, if you are in the energy industry and you're not hooked into CISA, I strongly encourage you that you do so. They've got representatives scattered throughout the country um, and they're very happy to talk about this sort of stuff. They articulate things I've been saying in this presentation. The UAS related threats may include weaponized or smuggling payloads. They may include prohibited surveillance and reconnaissance. They may include intellectual property theft and they may include inter inter intentional disruption or harassment. This is a US government agency saying this thing. This is worth paying attention to. Um, what actions can you take? Um, as Jacob and others have said uh, during this presentation, we're somewhat hampered in the United States. So their first bullet point is research and implement legally approved counter UAS technology. Um, they also then get into things that don't require buying a counter UAS system. And I apologize to the counter UAS vendors out there, but there's a lot of things you can do without spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on counter UAS systems to help protect your facility. And I'll get into some of them here and on the next slide as well. Know the air domain around the facility and who has authority to take action to enhance the security. If you're in with a bunch of other energy facilities, you know, build a community whereby you're getting advanced notice uh, you're doing information sharing within your own community. Uh, contact the FAA can consider UAS restrictions. We're all working on that. Update your emergency incident action plans. This is worth doing. If only so people know what to look for, what data to gather, and this goes to Chris Church's uh, presentation way at the early part of the day, you know, figure out how to gather information about these incidents in a methodical fashion and report it in a consistent fashion so we can start understanding the problem. Um, build federal, state, and local partnerships and report the potential UAS threats to your local law enforcement agency. This is a great slide. Um, if you take nothing else from my slide, uh, my presentation, I would suggest taking this one. This is an example of some of those CISA recommendations in action. Um, I was doing a presentation at B-Sides New Orleans uh, two years ago now. I uh, met this gentleman. Um, his contact information is in the appendix. There's another slide down there. This is a example of collaboration between the Coast Guard, InfraGuard, um, and for those not in the United States, the InfraGuard is a uh, FBI initiative for sharing information between the private sector and the uh, FBI. Um, and so it's a collaboration between the Coast Guard, the FBI, and a lot of the energy infrastructure operators in uh, the New Orleans area, uh, particularly Port of New Orleans. They've established this relationship back in 2016. And one of the things they've done is they've got a mandatory requirement for saying, hey, I'm gonna be flying a UAV in the area. So if you see a UAV over your facility, you can call somebody in and say, hey, I'm seeing a UAV. They look at their list and say, nope, it shouldn't be there. Now you know you got some sort of threat or now you don't. You can now make a much quicker decision. It's not automated at the moment, well, it may be, but it doesn't have to be automated. It could be as simple as a phone call and somebody looking at an Excel spreadsheet or pulling up a piece of paper. The, it's simple to get started on this stuff. It costs you very little. It builds relationships and it starts giving you a situational awareness of what is and is not going on in your airspace or the airspace that you're sharing. Um, they did automate a fair bit of this and how much of it, I do not know. Um, reach out to them. Um, but they are bringing in a lot of information and making it available to all the people participating in this, such as safety exercises and training um, and things like that. And I'm just making sure I'm not about a ton. I'm good. Um, this is a, 
a part of a larger deck from a gentleman. His contact information is later on in it. Um, he was doing red teaming and found that essentially doing red teaming was frustrating. Um, it really wasn't a challenge. Um, what he stepped back and did um, is start doing adversary modeling, so threat modeling. Um, and this is one example of one of his tools where he looks at essentially a very compact kill chain. Um, and for those not familiar with it, uh, the kill chain is basically the steps that an adversary must take to go from start to actually having an effect on the target. Um, in the cybersecurity world, it was uh, getting the, exfilling the data out of our environment. Um, in this per sort of circumstances, it's actually gathering the intelligence or delivering the payload. The take home from a kill chain is that if you can stop the kill chain at any point before they finish their mission, you have succeeded to some degree. So this is sort of a very compact UAV kill chain for a threat actor. And he goes through a bunch of the steps that they would have to get through to accomplish their mission. And each one of these steps is an opportunity for you to deny them the ability to accomplish that step and to uh, deny them their overall mission. So he's got a bunch of tools for helping you do this sort of stuff. One of the easiest ones is helping site operators figure out where somebody might launch a UAV from. You know, why is this interesting? Well, you could just put a game camera out there and have it out there and check it once a day or do it wirelessly and see if there's somebody launching UAVs from any of these locations that this model demonstrates. If they are, Go talk to them and say, why are you flying UAVs over my property? You've now, with essentially a little bit of consulting work and a game camera or you know, a little bit of higher end security camera, started implementing counter UAS without having to worry about um, hacking into a, a data link or anything like that. So very much worth considering. Uh, this gentleman's great. Uh, there are other people out there. You can do it yourself. Very much worth considering. Um, if you're in the United States, I'm familiar with ISACs. Um, they are basically a private sector vertical information uh, collaboration for sharing cybersecurity vulnerabilities and responses to it. Um, the FS ISAC is the one I was most involved in, uh, financial services ISAC. There are a bunch of others. Um, I proposed an AV ISAC for everybody who had anything to do with autonomous vehicles to join this organization um, and share information within a well-orchestrated uh, lockdown environment. This is membership-driven. There's a bunch of issues with it. Um, I never got it off the ground. Um, I think I was a little bit too early. You know, maybe it's time to revisit it. If you're interested in it, come let me know. This one is a solution that when I was doing cybersecurity was incredibly impactful. It requires trust. It requires a bunch of people to say, a bunch of people and their organizations say, yeah, we understand why the needs of the many outweigh essentially our own competitive advantage. Um, what was going on is that we had a very secure uh, mechanism for sharing uh, TTPs, tactics, tools, and procedures, as well as malware signatures and things like that. Um, and there were people from opposing firms, consulting firms from, uh, security vendors from malware vendors, uh, malware um, protection vendors, all that sort of stuff. People that had an honest competitive interest in not collaborating with each other, but they all came together because they understood that within the right model, within the right information sharing model, that they could still further their own company's interests and possibly even benefit their company's interest by getting this information from other companies. Um, and also help protect national security. The reason I think this is important and the reason I think that threat intelligence sharing and development is important is this list of bullet points. So I've said this other slide is more, most important. This is another one. We're engaged in a futuristic war. Um, things I read as science fiction even three years ago are now in the present. We've got to bring everything we can to bear to get caught up and get ahead of the threat actors. If we don't do that, we're gonna be under-resourced and behind the curve, and it's gonna get very frustrating, which is one of the reasons I exited the cybersecurity space. Uh, we're also often asked to fight last year's battles, which I also find particularly frustrating. We need to be thinking ahead so that we have the right solutions in place when the threat actors catch up to us 
rather than vice versa. Um, our adversaries are similar to the cybersecurity adversaries. They range from activists to criminals to non-state actors to nation state actors, which means that their motivations and their capabilities and uh, their ability to show up in the country are wide ranging. Um, if it's just one of these groups, it'd be much easier. There's no just one potential threat organization. We have limited resources. Um, the federal government has even more limited resources. And with COVID sucking up uh, a lot of budgets, you know, and increasing the national deficit and things like that, those resources may even be further challenged. We in the United States are hampered by a very challenging regulatory environment. Uh, Jacob and others have talked to that. Um, it really hamstrings our ability to respond. So we need to think creatively, creatively and we need to think collaboratively. If we are working with limited intelligence, it is often due to our own inability or unwillingness to collaborate. We need to find ways of collaborating. My proposal, the, the organization I was uh, referring to for the cybersecurity stuff, operate with two rules. One was the Chatham House rule. And by the way, it's Chatham House rule. There's only one rule. Um, participants are free to use the information received, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers nor that of any other participant may be revealed. So don't out anybody. Um, don't out their organization. It compromises this whole entire effort. And then the other fundamental tool was the traffic light protocol. If something's tagged TLP red, you are not to disclose it. It's restricted to people in the, org in the conversation only. Amber, limited disclosure, restricted participants, organizations. So you can take it back to your organization, but they cannot then go use it for public um, speaking or press releases. TLP green, you know, restricted to the community, TLP white. So this is a framework, it's a potential for how to create this sort of trusted sharing community among people who might otherwise not be able to collaborate. Um, in the appendix to this presentation, there's a lot more details on it. You can just reach out to me as well. Um, the, uh, another option is the organization that's supporting this presentation. Um, they are in the threat intelligence business. They have tools for doing this. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for us to support each other and support the community. And I'm deeply thankful to Mike uh, for giving us all this opportunity. And I'm really deeply thankful to all the other presenters for adding context and color to the whole thing. And finally, I'm very thankful to everybody who's taken the time today to listen to me and to the other speakers. Um, without you, um, we wouldn't know what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. And I really encourage everybody who's been in this conversation today to continue joining the conversation. Reach out publicly, reach out privately, uh, join one of the uh, organizations or mechanisms for sharing information. Tell us what your problems are um, and really help us help you. Uh, so with that, my presentation's over and I will see if I can get back to normal. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, uh, David. That was just a terrific presentation. And I I, <laughs> I kind of stopped writing down um, quotes there at the end because you just had so many, but a, a few really stood out to me that I just want to repeat. You know, the one was that um, you're saying we're kind of doing a, a national security disservice by not sharing some of that information. Um, and the other kind of thing that you said right at the end, which matched something you said at the start, was, you know, we're fighting last year's battles, we're selling solutions for last year's challenges, and it does kind of feel that way. And I think with your experience in cybersecurity, you probably feel like with drones, we do have the ability to restart on a better a better note. You know, cybersecurity really was a bit of a, a haywire, and, and we're still trying to play catch up. And so we're we're still early days. I st I still believe that you know we're still early days, and there might be you know ways to get around that and better prepare for the next few years. Um, so just absolutely you know mind boggling there. And I just want to quickly discuss the the working group you were talking about a little bit there. Um, you mentioned the AV ISAC. Um, but was that what you had in mind in terms of the you know drone sharing information sharing uh, that you linked towards the end as a new type of working group? Or is that something you want to reboot the AV ISAC? Maybe just a bit more information on that would be good. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there are two way, There are multiple ways of going about sharing information. Um, the AV ISAC is the above the board, loud and proud 
um, mechanism for doing that. Um, it does have full-time people running the organization to catalog and organize the, the information. Um, it's got a director who's out there bringing in uh, new uh, people to participate in it. Um, so there's membership fees for it. And you know, for some of the existing ISACs, that's $25,000 a year for the larger organizations. So it is a very good mechanism. It's a very well-established United States mechanism for doing this sort of thing. The other solution is the sort of the other end of the spectrum. It's very on the quiet. Um, it's almost like Fight Club. You don't say that you're part of this particular organization. Um, we actually did say you could be say part of it, but um, and it's, it costs essentially nothing, or it costs very little. Um, we were using um, secure email with PGP encryption. Uh, we had a very secure minimal wiki. Um, you know, just a bunch of sort of open source tools that somebody took the time to really secure really well. Um, and then it was a trust-based relationship where you know a couple of people got together, it started working for them, and they started bringing more and more people in. The odd thing is that the hacking community already has this. So I'm a member of one of the hacking groups, um, and I'm one of the few people in there that uses my full name, so you can go find me. Um, but I'm a trusted member of that organization now. And it's got the classic hacking community thing where you sort of work your way in through the levels. There's a wealth of information in there. And th that particular group is not our adversary. Um, please, if anybody's watching it, don't think that I'm saying as much. They have been a tremendous uh, source of information for me to better understand the hobby community, the hacking community, what is and is not possible. And I hope I've been able to give back to their community as well. Um, but they are a model of, hey, here's how people can share information um, and do so in a secure fashion. Um, so both the AVI SAC and the other model are uh, worth doing. Um, I think it's much faster to go stand up the sort of trusted relationship between peers uh, model and the AVI SAC is likely unless some one or two large uh, companies, AirMap, uh, Precision Hawk, somebody like that says, yeah, we understand the value of it. We'll be founding charter members of it. Mm. Yeah, well, and, you know, I, I guess in terms of what you were mentioning about some of those hacking groups, you really did fill that in in one of your threat matrix there, where, for example, you had, uh, you know, the drone hobbyists with the compliance and all the way down, but the uninhibited is quite interesting because that's almost like your drivers who, you know, go a little faster, do some burnouts, do some donuts, but they're really experienced drivers and they're doing it in controlled matters. And sure, sometimes that can reflect a bad name on the industry, um, but they are controlled and sometimes they're in a safer uh, position than those who maybe don't know the rules and are acting unskilled. So quite an interesting concept that you talk about there. And I think when it comes down to that, um, you know, you want to look at what's the actual threat to infrastructure, as you said, is it the uninhibited or is it actually the threat actors who want to do that uh, with their motivations and their goals? So I think that's yeah really quite important. So I do have some questions here for you, David, if you, uh, if you still have time to answer them. Yep, happy to. Brilliant. Um, so the, the first question came in uh, from Ken and said, uh, how on earth is there no result for the Eastern Colorado incident? Was the army not involved? What would it take to trigger military intervention? And how was the FBI not involved in this? Um, to answer the last question first, um, I think every single possible federal agency that might have had some bearing on the problem got involved. Sheriff's Department, FBI, um, the uh, there are nuclear there are uh, missile silos in that region as well. So uh, the strategic command got involved. Um, everybody was involved at some point. Um, how how was it not resolved? Um, one hypothesis is that somebody was out there essentially red teaming something. Um, I through the community could certainly go hire some of the appropriate people to go operate those sorts of UAVs in a covert fashion. There's plenty of spaces out there to hide in. Um, and what that really illuminated for all of us is that the mechanisms are not in place for identifying this sort of activity. Um, and as long as the operators are practicing good OPSEC and not talking about what they were doing, um, it's relatively easy to go do that. And similarly, and that's where Palo Verde comes in, you know, how on earth did somebody fly for two nights running for 80, 50 min oh, 80 minutes at a time over the largest nuclear reactor in the United States and no one know what happened? It's the same sort of thing. 
Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's that's quite interesting. And when it comes to the one of these next questions, and it probably ties into that, is um, you you speak a lot about the, the tip, different and typical issues to infrastructure. Um, but what are your actual recommendations for infrastructure hardening? Uh, and does Counter UAS actually fall into that? There's a second part of the question, but I'll let you answer that first. Uh, Counter UAS is one of many uh, things that you need to consider about how to protect your site. Um, if you're, I used to do executive protection, so we were protecting homes. Um, the first thing we did was threat intelligence. The first thing we did is figure out what sort of people might be coming at us and what sort of resources it might be bring to bear on us and how to start mitigating all the risks that they posed. Um, for a site, uh, counter UAS is certainly going to be part of the answer. And it may not be counter UAS with neutralization turned on. It may just be counter UAS with just pure detection turned on so you understand whether there is or is not a problem. If you have a UAV over your site, uh, there may be certain steps you would want to take. Um, other things will be you know, thinking about your OPSEC. You know, are your radio links encrypted? So if you've got somebody flying a drone over there to pick up your radio traffic, can they actually get anything? Um, you're going to need to look at um, if you're thinking about it from a drone perspective, can you push back um, your sight lines? So if, do you have like woods or anything encroaching on your fences? If you can push that back a quarter mile or half a mile, you now extend the amount of time that a UAV needs to fly to get over your site. That gives you more response time. It makes it more difficult for the operator. And all those sorts of things that make it more difficult for the uh, potential threat actor to have their desired effect upon you are things you can do, or many of the things you can do without actually deploying a counter UAS system. That said, counter UAS systems do bring value. Simply knowing that something is overhead um, is very helpful, and eventually you will get that neutralization capability. Okay, and then there was uh, there was another question that came in actually via email, which is the only email question tonight, and it said, um, so what is Ursa specifically as a company doing about this, and how are you involved? Um, I specifically left out all the marketing from this presentation. Um, thank you for asking. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. URSA is Unmanned and Robotic Systems Analysis. Um, we fundamentally uh, focus on extracting telemetry data from a variety of unmanned systems, um, applying advanced analytics to that machine learning, statistical analysis, AI if appropriate, and developing visualization tools to help a variety of different types of people understand what is going on with unmanned systems. Um, it could be regulators wanting to know, hey, how close are UAVs getting to manned aircraft? There's a lot of reports of that, but we don't have any hard evidence to say, here's how close they really were getting. We're working with the FAA to help understand that. Uh, we're working with counter UAS industry by helping do some of these tests, we're the system of record for some of these test and evaluation exercises so that there is a single source of truth, all the information about how the aircraft and the counter UAS systems were behaving are in one spot. And so now you can say, the UAV was here, the counter UAS system thinks it was here, why is there a discrepancy? And finally, we're helping operators um, understand how their systems are behaving um, and starting to do some predictive analytics for operators so that they can help reduce the potential of in-flight failures. So it comes down to, we're not doing imagery analysis, we're doing telemetry analysis, and we're really doing it to help people understand the who, what, when, why, where, how of unmanned systems. Brilliant. Well, hopefully uh, that answers your question. And David, I'll forward you the, the person's contact as well who asked that. Thank you. So uh, David, I want to thank you again for, for your time and dedication as well to uh, extend that to Tim Wright. Um, so thank you, Tim and David, for both for your contribution. And I'm sure uh, there's others in the ERSA the team that all contributed. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm just going to switch to my screen now. And David, I want to...